Today we will learn and reflect on William O'Malley's history, what happened at Vatican II. Pope Benedict once said that both the supporters and the opponents of the Second Vatican Council have one characteristic in common. That is, most of them have never read the decrees or the history of Vatican II and are really totally ignorant of the actual teachings of the Council. And Cardinal Ratzinger's solution as well as Pope John Paul II's solution to this dilemma was to draft the Catholic Catechism, but unfortunately nobody reads that either. A priest once compared the Second Vatican Council to a Japanese fishing boat. One sunny morning, a fisherman and his young son went far out to sea to fish. Late in the day, the son took a nap because he was real tired from the hot sun. And while he was napping, the boat slowly rose and slowly fell through many deep swells like the father had never seen before. Later that day, after they'd finished fishing, when they tried to return to their village, there was no village. There was only death, debris, destruction, and dank water as far as the eye could see. The little boy was devastated. Their family was gone. The little boy cried in terror, and the little boy blamed the boat for the catastrophe. Why? The little boy blamed the boat because he hadn't seen or experienced the terror of the tsunami. And the Catholic Church was experiencing a great historical tsunami, unnoticed to many at the time because it was a tsunami in slow motion, in the 60s when the Vatican II went to throw open the windows of the church to the modern world. This was not a council pushed on the church by liberal popes. On the contrary, many bishops from around the world eagerly participated in the council. This is the exact opposite of a rubber stamp council. Society and the church were overwhelmed by the tsunami of changes in the 60s. Changes set in motion by the events of World War II, and Vatican II was merely the boat seeking a better place for the church. So it is with Vatican II. Many conservative Catholics see the permissiveness of the past 50 years, the breakdown of morals, the breakdown of family life, the shortage of priests and vocations, the mocking of the faithful. But they do not blame the vast sea of change sweeping society, but rather they blame the boat. They blame the Church Fathers of Vatican II who sought clear passage through the difficult waters of the modern world. And the story is also an allegory of the common misconception of both Trent and Vatican II. That Trent was the true Catholic Council and that Vatican II abandoned the theology of Trent. And the opposite is true. The theology of Trent was adopted with few changes. While the reforms of Vatican II were political, they restated the Catholic faith to the world in a pastoral manner, embracing democracy while discouraging totalitarianism. And in the Trent Decrees you'll read, if you believe such and such, contrary to Catholic doctrine, anathema to you. But the Church of Vatican II seeks rather to dialogue with its separate brethren in Christ and respectfully put forth the Catholic beliefs. And indeed, Vatican II speaks to people of all faiths and nations. Vatican II was a rediscovery of the reforming aspects of the Council of Trent. Indeed, theologically speaking, it might be more accurate to refer to this council as Trent II rather than Vatican II. And another reason why both Protestants and Catholics regard Trent as a reactionary council is that the popes sealed the historical records of the Council of Trent immediately because in the polemic battles of the time, Protestants would have cherry-picked the history to trash Catholicism. They were open late in the 19th century to scholars, and prior to the calling of the Second Vatican Council, a German scholar, Herbert J. Dean, published a three-volume history of Trent, including excerpts from many of the proceedings. Only two of these volumes have been translated into English, but they are a primary source for John O'Malley in his book, Trent, What Happened at the Council? The implication is that the histories of Trent written before the 70s probably did not consult this history of the proceedings of Trent and thus cannot be used as a reliable primary historical source. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Please feel free to follow along in the PowerPoint script we uploaded to SlideShare. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. The two great wars had swept away the large continental monarchies of Europe that had once supported the Catholic Church, and they were replaced by totalitarian fascist regimes. And although several fascist regimes were friendly to the Catholic Church in the short run, most were hostile or harmful to the Catholic Church in the long run. Indeed, Vatican II was unimaginable without the changes wrought by World War II. 
For example, the fascist regime of Mussolini in Italy was initially the friend of the Catholic Church. Although he personally was neither devout nor moral, and he was both a murderer and an adulterer, Mussolini and the Pope signed the Lateran Treaty, creating the Vatican City, and guaranteed that the Church had an exclusive role in the schools and in the Italian culture. But shortly before World War II, Mussolini went full Nazi and started persecuting the Jews, much to the consternation of the Pope. The fascist regime of Spain was the friend of the Catholic Church, and although both sides in the Spanish Civil War were guilty of massacres, the communists on the Republican side murdered priests and monks and nuns by the thousands. Once Hitler gained absolute power, the Nazis started persecuting both the Jews and the Protestant and Catholic churches. The Pope and some German bishops opposed the Nazis as best they could. Only 20% of the Protestant churches were confessing churches that opposed interference with the Nazi regime. The Catholic conservative Vichy French regime collaborated with the Nazi regime, combining the pro-life, pro-Catholic policies of the government with assisting the Nazis in persecuting the Jews in France. These bad experiences with totalitarianism meant that the Vatican II Council would embrace democracy with all its problems as the system of government most conducive to religious liberty and toleration in the long run. We discussed this in our video on the decree of religious freedom, and we did this video first because this is a key video to understand the history of Vatican II. And we plan to record videos for the other major decrees, with their history and studying the verbiage of the decrees themselves. Now another consequence of World War II was that most former European colonies in Asia and Africa were gaining their independence, some peacefully, some through revolution. Catholics in these countries wanted to run the churches in their countries, and they desired liturgies that reflected their local cultures. John O'Malley also tells the story of the reforms implemented by the Catholic Church in the long 19th century from the defeat of Napoleon to the start of World War I, and the events in this period helped prepare the Church for Vatican II. And we will also have a video on how Pope John XXIII came to call the Vatican II Council into session, and the book by Yves Congar on true and false reform in the Church that so impressed John that he appointed Congar to a key position in the preparatory commission that was preparing documents for the Council. These initial documents were sent for comments to all the bishops around the world. The cardinals in the Curia in Rome occupied key positions on the commission. They expected that the bishops would rubber stamp their proposals. But this did not happen. The bishops instead insisted on becoming very involved in the process, rewriting key documents from scratch. Pope John XXIII wanted the council to be collegial in fact, although he sometimes let it be known what his positions were, and he allowed the bishops and the council free reign to discuss the matters they were facing in their diocese, and also the issues the church was facing when it confronted the modern world. Although Pope John XXIII's family had the lineage of an ancient aristocratic family, the family money had been dissipated many generations in the past, and now his family were impoverished sharecroppers. He showed promise in his schooling and in his priesthood and his service as a medic in World War I, and after that he held many unusual posts in the church. He was the apostolic delegate to Turkey and Greece. He saved many Jews by his diplomatic efforts during World War II and he served as apostolic nuncio to secular France after the war, and then cardinal in Venice. Now his postings in the orthodox, Muslim, and secular world widened his horizons, and led to his calling of the council. The council would meet for four sessions. Pope John XXIII died soon after the closing of the first session, and Pope Paul VI was elected pope with his promise that he would continue the work of the council. Paul's family was upper middle class, and he served in the Curia as a priest, and he intervened in the workings of the council more frequently, and you might say he was a little bit more conservative than was John. There were four main documents or constitutions drafted by Vatican II, and the first constitution to be discussed when Vatican II was convened in April 1962 was Sacrosanctum Concilium, in English, the Sacred Council, regarding the liturgy of the Mass and the original document from the Preparatory Commission was progressive, in part because the prior popes 11th and 12th, who were popes during and after World War II, had themselves worked on liturgical reform. Plus, the new scholarships studying the newly opened archives of Trent revealed that the actual Trent proceedings indicated that they were open to a mass in the vernacular languages, but in the polemics of the day. The Latin mass helped define Catholicism against the vernacular Protestants. 
Likewise, Trent was open to sharing both the bread and the cup in the Eucharist with the layman, but again, receiving only the host was seen as something that defined you as Catholic. There was a consensus in the Council that the pastoral problem was that ordinary Catholics were mere spectators rather than active participants in the Mass. Since the Latin Mass was an unintelligible to many worshippers, they instead substituted devotions such as praying to the Rosary for actual participation. And there was also a shift from the medieval view that redemption came mainly through Christ's suffering and death, and more emphasis on his resurrection and the Easter event. In contrast, as O'Malley states, there was a shift in spirituality. Now the view is that the liturgy is nourishment for one's spiritual life. That is, part of the church's call to holiness. Intelligibility and simplicity were now the norms. The new emphasis is that Christ is present in the Word of Scripture as well as in the Eucharist. And this emphasis on the Word encouraged a new emphasis of Scripture in Catholic teaching and piety, a major theme in the Council. And this will be reflected in the other Constitution, De Verbum. While the essential structure of the Roman Rite was to be maintained, local adaptation, especially in missionary countries, was legitimate and encouraged. Thus, local bishops or Episcopal conferences were permitted to make decisions regarding the liturgy. No doubt the Vatican II attendees remembered the collapse of the Jesuit Christian mission in China when the Vatican refused to permit chanting the Mass in the vernacular some centuries before. About a year later, Sacrosanctum Concilium was the first constitution to be passed nearly unanimously by the bishops. As O'Malley relates, the priest, instead of celebrating the Mass with his back to the congregation, now faced the pews. And this change signified that the ceremony was an act of worship of a gathered community, as well as a sacrifice to God performed in the congregation's name. And although some parts of the Mass could be chanted in Latin, within a few years the Mass in its entirety was being celebrated in the vernacular worldwide. The liturgy is central to the Christian experience. O'Malley thus views this decision as crucial to the direction of the Council, foretelling the direction of future debates, and O'Malley lists four principles key to understanding Vatican II. And the first is the principle of aggiornamento, or adaptation to contemporary circumstances. But this decree also relied on the principle of ressourcement, which is a return to the ancient sources of the ancient church fathers and the medieval church fathers in order to find their way. The Mass was thus not so much modernized as it was made to conform more closely to fundamental and traditional values, and the principle of adaptation to local circumstances. O'Malley quotes the decree, The Church does not wish to impose a rigid uniformity in matters that do not involve the faith or the good of the whole community, enabling the Church to step out of its European box and the principle of Episcopal authority and of greater decision-making on the local level and Episcopal collegiality. And also the final principle is encouraging the full and active participation of everybody present in the liturgy. And this is a principle of engagement and active responsibility. And by implication, it extends beyond the liturgy of the church to the church at large, to the church as the people of God. And in first session, Dave Urban, which is the decree and revelation, would not enjoy clear sailing. Although it was eventually passed nearly unanimously, it was passed late in the fourth session three years later, as were many of the decrees. The draft proposed by Cardinal Ottaviani of the Curia was overly conservative and not well received. And Pope John XXIII intervened to suggest a mixed commission representing both conservative and progressive theologians and bishops to draft a replacement decree. One key issue was the Reformation debate on whether scripture or tradition was the primary source of Christian truth. Luther had declared that scripture alone contained the Christian message, forcing Catholics to argue for the primacy of tradition. However, Herbert J. Dean's scholarship on Trent revealed, in O'Malley's words, that subsequent Catholic interpretation of Trent's few words on the subject, using polemic against Protestants, had gone far beyond what Trent intended to say. The Progressive Council Father, Yves Congar, had written a book on the meaning of tradition, but he could only go back to the years following the Reformation to explore this debate, because the Olegens simply did not debate this issue before the Reformation, and Scripture versus Tradition was something that neither the ancient Church Fathers, nor the Carolingian Church Fathers, nor the medieval Church Fathers discussed. When Dave Urban was approved, one distinguished Catholic journal proclaimed, we can now consider the year of the Counter-Reformation ended and a new era for Christendom with unforeseen circumstances begun.
Now we'll discuss the ending of the first period. The conservative Cardinal Ottaviani introduced the constitution of the church, De Ecclesia, which sparked deep disagreements when it was being presented. As O'Malley noted, the schema was long, including chapters on the church militant, on church membership, on the episcopacy, on religious orders, on the laity, on the magisterium or teaching office, on authority and obedience in the church, on church-state relations, and finally on ecumenicism. In particular, it emphasized that obedience to the ecclesiastical, especially papal authority, was the remedy for the crisis of authority in the world that afflicted even some members of the Catholic Church. And Smet delivered a widely quoted speech that even Eve Congar thought was overly harsh, as O'Malley puts it. He denounced the schema for its three isms, triumphalism, clericalism, and juridicism. He thought that the document had a pompous and romantic style with a triumphalist spirit out of touch with the reality of the humble people of God. Its clericalism had everything flowing from top to bottom, ignoring the horizontal relationships in the church. The reality of the people of God is more fundamental than the hierarchy of the church. We must be aware of falling into some kind of bishop worship or pope worship. And finally, the church is more our mother than a juridical institution. And I want to point out the irony of the painting that I used to illustrate this concept. What better example of triumphalism is this picture of conquistadors praying before they enter the capital of the Aztec Empire to slaughter the king and the leadership and the people of that Indian culture. Then another bishop pointed out that the footnotes only went back a hundred years during the time of the Catholic and Protestant polemic war of words and that there was no support cited by either medieval or ancient church fathers. This celebrated the embattled monarchical view of the Counter-Reformation. Before the council adjourned, Cardinal Swenens, in close consultation with Pope John XXIII, addressed the council and declared that a central theme was needed to give direction to the council. The council should emphasize what unites Catholics with others, not what separates them. He suggested the theme, quoting from the Pope, of the Church of Christ, Light to the World, or Ecclesia Christi, Lumen Gentium. And Lumen Gentium would be the name of the Constitution to replace De Ecclesia. As O'Malley states, the theme has two parts. The first part looks at the inner reality of the Church and asks the question, what do you say of yourself? And the second part concerns the relationship of the Church to the world outside it and asks questions about the human person, about social justice, about evangelizing the poor, and about world peace. O'Malley continues, The Council will proceed with three dialogues. A dialogue with its own membership. An ecumenical dialogue with brothers and sisters not now visibly united with it. And a dialogue with the modern world. Thus, you could argue that Vatican II was just as much an evangelical council as it was an ecumenical council. I also want to add that Protestant and Orthodox and non-Christian observers were invited to observe the proceedings of the Council. And Cardinal Swainens, speaking for the Pope, asked that the Council adopt that program for its future work. Let us hope that this plan I propose will open a way for a better hearing of the Church and understanding of it by the world today, and that Christ will, for the men and women of our times, be evermore the way, the truth, and the light. Powerful applause, O'Malley applauds. This intervention did three things, according to O'Malley. It moved the Council from a scattershot approach. It contributed to the growing consensus that the original texts needed more than touching up. The bishops were now expected to be active participants in the Council. And this sowed the seeds for the drafting of a new distinctive constitution, Gaudium et Spex, the Church in the Modern World. The Council adjourned the first session with a Mass celebrated by Pope John XXIII, which was the last time most participants would see the Pope, and he would be replaced by Pope Paul VI, who pledged to continue the work of the Council. The second session began with the discussion of the new schema on the Church, Lumen Gentium. The text revised during the recess differed from De Ecclesia, as O'Malley explains. The chapters on ecumenicism, evangelizing, religious life, and church-state relations had to be excised and reassigned to the other commissions and the other constitutions. The chapter on the magisterium in obedience and authority in the church had disappeared from the schema and from the council altogether, as likely did the discussion on the church militant. O'Malley continues, One obvious change was that with the exception of the chapter on the hierarchy, 
Its style is filled with biblical images and patristic allusions. In the final version, Lumen Gentium almost overflows with images of the church and its members which suggest fecundity, dignity, abundance, charism, goodness, safe haven, welcome, communion, tenderness, and warmth. This style points to the call to holiness. Most significant is the addition of the statement that Christ calls every Christian to holiness and provides the grace and other means to accomplish it regardless of one's station in life regardless of whether someone is a clergyman or a layman. Christians fulfill a call through love of God and neighbor in imitation of Christ. Lumen Gentium refers to the church as a sacrament, which conservatives objected to, since they thought that the classic seven sacraments are the only sacraments. By far the biggest controversy in Lumen Gentium was the tension between papal authority and collegiality, or the authority of the bishops, individually and in concert. O'Malley spends many pages on the wrangling and appeals to the Pope on this issue, but in the end the principle of collegiality was affirmed, as was the authority of the Pope. Lumen Gentium in the third chapter teaches the key theme of Vatican II, the pastors were instituted in the church not so that they could take upon themselves the whole burden of building up the mystical body of Christ, but that they might nourish and govern the faithful so everyone would cooperate in accomplishing the common task. Reverence and obedience are due to those pastors, but equal reverence is due to those in the church impelled by the Spirit, who are often laymen. And this is what Lumen Gentium says about infallibility. The people of Christ as a whole are infallible in their faith when that faith represents a consensus. Such infallibility is a charism that of course includes bishops and the Pope, but does not rest exclusively in them. And debate on Lumen Gentium continued in the next session with few changes. One reform in Lumen Gentium was to reinstitute the diaconate in the church, lower level of the clergy, and permit married men to serve in the diaconate, which was somewhat controversial. Now we'll discuss the ending of the second session. And the widespread support for ecumenicism was in part a response to the World War II experience, where both Catholics and Protestants resisted the Nazi regimes of Hitler's Germany and Vichy France. For example, during the war, Yves Congar developed many friendships with Protestants as a French prisoner of war, and his was not a unique experience. Before Vatican II, Catholicism was hostile to ecumenicism. O'Malley tells us that during the debate, Cardinal Ruffini summarized the Catholic apologetics that up to that time had been taught in every seminary textbook, that Christ founded only one church, the Roman Church. Faults cannot be attributed to the church, but only to its members. To leave the church because of its sinful members is itself a sin, and the one true church fervently hopes for the return of Protestants. And dialogue with non-Catholics is good if only if done according to the guidelines the Holy See will publish. And I might want to add that Vatican II didn't so much repeal these concepts as soften their application in practice. Missing from the document on ecumenicism is the call for non-Catholics to return to the Catholic Church. The document laid out some principles in ecumenicism, that change of heart and holiness of life, along with public and private prayer for the unity of Christians, should be regarded as the heart of the whole ecumenical movement. O'Malley adds that theology should be taught from an ecumenical viewpoint, not polemically. This decree on ecumenicism was held over to the next session, but the cause of ecumenicism was advanced when Pope Paul VI announced that he would go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land which was the first time a pope had left Italy voluntarily for over 500 years. After some months' recess, the third session came into session, and what was happening in the world at this time? President Kennedy had been assassinated, then his assassin was assassinated. The Vietnam War was accelerated, and an issue that was followed a little bit more closely in Europe, the French troops finally left Algeria. Now there was debate from a vocal minority who insisted that the principle of collegiality in Lumen Gentium posed a mortal danger to the church, and this vocal minority also constantly badgered the Pope, but the overwhelming majority voted for collegiality in the final document. It had been only 20 years since the world learned the full horror of the Nazi concentration camps where millions of Jews had died. The World Council of Churches had urged all churches to condemn anti-Semitism explicitly so originally the council had planned a short schema on the Jews, but this led to fears in the Arab world that the Vatican planned to recognize the state of Israel diplomatically, 
and this led to violent riots in many Arab cities and Eastern bishops fearing for the safety of Christians in their region. So then they moved it from a schema on the Jews and on Christians. And there was still diplomatic pressure on the Vatican, so Pope Paul VI suggested that the chapters on the Jews be included in Lumen Gentium. And the problem was that the anti-Semitic stances were justified in the past by passages in John that referred to the Jews as enemies of Christ. And the famous verse in Matthew where the mob at Christ's trial shouted to Pilate, His blood be upon us and our children. Nevertheless, when Cardinal Bay addressed the council, he immediately addressed the issue of deicide whether the Jews were guilty of murdering God. As O'Malley relates the speech, the leaders of the Jewish Sanhedrin who condemned Jesus were only a tiny percentage of the Jewish people. We cannot attribute to an entire people what a few leaders perpetrated. And how can we say that even those leaders knowingly committed deicide when Jesus himself asked the Father to forgive them for they know not what they do? Dave Urban was discussed and evaded the historical scripture tradition debate by saying God is a source of revelation, not scripture or tradition as such. In O'Malley's words, the schema innovated by presenting tradition in a more dynamic way, as in a symbiotic relationship to scripture and as the vital principle in the church of the transmission and interpretation of what God had revealed. Moreover, tradition progresses over time as understanding increases with reflection and experience. There was also discussion on what would become of Gaudium et Spes, the constitution of the church in the modern world. Human dignity is a major theme, including the dignity of human labor and the dignity of the family. O'Malley notes that running through the text were themes of human solidarity across ethnic, racial, religious, and socioeconomic differences and the obligation of all peoples to work together for a safer and more just world. The chapter on the dignity of marriage and the family departed from the traditional textbook terms of the primary ends of marriage, which is the procreation of children, and the secondary ends of marriage, which remedies concupiscence and the mutual help of the spouses. As O'Malley states, the document instead spoke at length about the holiness and goodness of the love that binds the spouses. Only then did it mention children as the fulfillment of that love. Second, it made the consciences of the spouses the deciding factor for the number of children they should bear. These were themes that Pope John Paul II would adopt in his teachings on the theology of the body. And finally, the schema did not explicitly reaffirm a condemnation of birth control. And after some months, the fourth session opened. And the decree on the Jews and the non-Christian religions was now named Nostra Etete, I think that's how you pronounce it, or In Our Times which was the first line of the text. And as you can tell, Jews are no longer in the title, which no doubt helped the Vatican on the diplomatic front. As O'Malley puts it, instead of beginning with the Jews, this decree begins with the common origin and destiny of humanity. Then it discusses Hinduism and Buddhism. This is followed by a long section on Muslims, not to let them feel left out. Then discuss the Jews after it discussed the Muslims, and it discussed the Jews in the section before the conclusion. But the clause condemning deicide was still causing problems. Arab states thought that this had a political agenda, and there were more riots, and Eastern bishops were now concerned. So Pope Paul VI intervened to exclude the denial of the guilt of deicide from the text. But it is still part of the teachings of the Council. Pope Paul VI wanted the Council to pass the decree on religious liberty before his planned speech before the United Nations. He did not want to be embarrassed by hundreds of bishops voting against freedom of religion. Was this a contest between bishops of predominantly Catholic countries who believe the state should enforce religious Catholic conformity versus the minority Catholic countries, including the communist countries, where freedom of religion guaranteed the freedom of Catholics to follow their faith? And indeed, the debate really did break down along those lines. And the speech by Joseph Lefebvre, and he is not related to the Bishop Lefebvre that started the SPPX or the Society of Pope Pius X and broke away from the church. Joseph Lefebvre helped sway many bishops to support the decree. His argument was summarized by O'Malley. First, the decree would not foster subjectivism and religious indifference. Second, it would not mean that the council abdicated the position that the Catholic Church was the only church of Jesus Christ. Third, it would not have a bad effect because of the dissemination of error. Fourth, it would not diminish missionary spirit. And I might want to add that Cardinal Ratzinger in the Ratzinger Report, issued some decades after the decree, 
did indeed state that uh, the unfortunate consequence of the Vatican II was a diminishing of the missionary spirit, but that's for another video. Fifth, it does not exalt human beings at God's expense. Sixth, it does not contradict church tradition. And the vote was taking and it passed with a 90% majority, still a healthy majority, not as overwhelming as for most of the other decrees, but still a healthy majority. Next, the council discussed the very long guardian it specs on the church in the modern world. One challenge was that Pope Paul VI did not want the council to drag out into a fifth session and guardian it spes was long. And, unfortunately, the prominent German theologians Karl Rahner and Cardinal Ratzinger, who's the future Pope Benedict XVI, had misgivings about the text. Fortunately, Rahner and Ratzinger were added to the committee to modifying the text, which resolved the problem of their opposition. And the chapters in Part 1 of Gaudium et Spes are Vocation of the Human Person, the Human Community, Significance of Human Activity in the World, and the Role of the Church in the Modern World. One issue was whether communism should be condemned. Since this had already been done in other decrees prior to Vatican II, bishops from communist countries urged caution, fearing this would invite persecution. So no new condemnation was issued in this constitution. In the discussions on part two of Guardian et Spes on political life, the bishops discussed the sections on nuclear arms and warfare. Coincidentally, at this time, Pope Paul VI was addressing the United Nations in New York discussing many of the same topics. In his speech with deep emotion, he exclaimed, No more war, war never again. It is peace, peace that must guide the destiny of the people of the world and of all humanity. Pope Paul VI also said, What you proclaim here is the right and fundamental duties of human beings, their dignity, their liberty, and above all, their religious liberty. Just a few years earlier, it would have been unthinkable for a pope to say such things publicly in a speech for the world to hear. After the Council, Ottaviani asserted, war must be completely outlawed. In the nuclear age, the prior doctrine of just wars is obsolete. Should the Council condone stockpiling of nuclear weapons to guarantee peace? The text said yes, but few were happy with this assertion, although they thought it was a necessary assertion. On the section on marriage, the decree insisted on the equal personal dignity that must be accorded to man and wife in mutual and unreserved affection. Oh, Malley lists many small changes made to the many decrees ratified in this session also. And in the closing session attended by Pope Paul VI, the joint declaration of Pope Paul VI and the Orthodox Patriarch Athenagoras was read, regretting the excommunication of the Greeks by the Latins and the Latins by the Greeks in 1054, acknowledging the responsibility of both sides for the tragedy which happened a millennium prior to that council and promising to work towards a full communion between the two churches. And note, the Declaration does not use the word union, but full communion. The remaining non-controversial decrees passed with little controversy that we did not discuss. And we will discuss many of these in our future videos, especially when they're referenced by the Catholic Catechism, which we will study over the next few years. And there was great debate over the four constitutions which we discussed. In practice, there is little difference between the declarations and decrees and their effect. In the controversial declarations and decrees we have in boldface, and the two declarations on religious liberty in practice are in some ways as influential as the constitutions, and which is why we discuss the declaration of religious liberty first in its own separate video before we even discuss Vatican II. And so much of the Vatican II debate on the declaration of religious liberty was pushed into that video. And the decrees and declarations include those on the Eastern Churches, social communication, education, and the priesthood. Now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. We have as our main source, William O'Malley's book, What Happened at Vatican II, and also a similar book on the Council of Trent. We also have a video on book reviews of Vatican II, which includes William O'Malley's many books on Catholic history, especially from Trent to Vatican II, and many other authors of this period. And we also have the Catholic Catechism, which is a summary of the teachings of both the Councils of Trent and of Vatican II, and the Compendium, which includes many of the documents referenced in the Catechism, many of which are hard to find, plus the Bible verses and the order in which they are quoted in the Catechism. And we also have a video on the history of the Lutheran and Catholic Catechisms. We will have a long series of videos on each of the sections of the Catholic Catechism. 
The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, you can click on the meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.